Thank you, Matt. Church, let's stand together as we uh, sing a couple more songs of worship this morning. We know that we can do a lot of things on our own strength and, and in our own planning, but I believe and I believe it's true that if the Spirit of God is not here in this place, if he doesn't have the freedom to work in my heart and your heart, then, then all that we do is in vain. Then it's just, it's just religious practice. And God wants so much more. So let's offer him our hearts this morning. That when we leave this place today, we will say that something happened that only God could do. Salvation came, revival came to our hearts. Let's sing this old hymn together. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall
we can hang on his word this morning. His promises are true.
you bow with me in prayer this morning? Father, we, we come before you, a people in need of your grace this morning. And thank you, God, that you, you give it so freely because of Christ's sacrifice, because he laid down his life, we can have life in you. God, forgive us for taking that so lightly, so flippantly sometimes that we come before the throne of our creator God, lackadaisically. May our hearts truly be burdened for the lost. Father, may you truly have control of my life, of our life, of our church. That you would be glorified. And that is my prayer this morning. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated at this time this morning. As we continue in the spirit of worship and our worship service this morning, we'll go into our offering time. So if our ushers will go ahead and come forward. As Ryland said, you know, Spirit of God, we've called upon. All of everything that we have belongs to God. Thank you for how you generously give. The fact that our youth are ministering in another church in North Tulsa right now, because of what you give, because it helps offset those costs. The people we have in Nicaragua and all the things that you do, you give through the, or your budget, a portion of that goes to our missions budget, which they help support so many things. Thank you for your generous giving. If you came prepared to give today, and we know that not everyone gives each and every Sunday, but if you came prepared to give today, there's a little card in the back of your chair. You can also give in the offering plate, but you can also give according on this card here. shows two other ways, one by texting and one by just going to online there and doing that. But thank you for supporting the ministries of Central Baptist Church. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for this opportunity to spend this day we call Sunday, Lord, your worship day. We thank you for Ryland and his worship team, Lord, has brought, to, brought us to this point in the service, Lord. And we just, again, thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are there and desire to be part of our needs. And God, we just thank you for those that are on mission this week, Lord, from Central, that you continue to be with them. And God, just continue to be with our pastor search committee and guide and direct them as we get so much closer to, you know, re you revealing the person you would have us to be our shepherd here at Central. And God, again, we just thank you for this offering that we're about to partake and just be with it. And God, multiply it and use it according to your kingdom work, Lord. And Lord, let us not just, uh, you know, think of monetary the way we give our tithe, but also of our time, Lord, and telling others about you. And again, Lord, we just thank you so much for the staff of this church as we continue to bless them and bless all those who are traveling during this time of fall break and bring them back to us safely. And Lord, protect those from the storms this evening, Lord, as you know, we need the rain. But uh, Lord, we know, <clears throat> you know, there, there are things that come with the storms, but there are also things that come with storms of life. And but we know you are, again, are the great comforter. Just be with us in all that we do, Lord, that you might be glorified. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Right now is the time in our service. We're going to dismiss our kids to go off to Children's Church. Ages four years old through kindergarten can be dismissed first right out these doors over here. Four years old through kindergarten. All right, our first through fourth graders can calmly line up to go to Children's Church. <laughs> we don't want any, any more collisions in weeks past. Parents, if, you're, if this is your child's first time to go to Children's Church, the younger group we dismiss first is halfway down the hall, and this older group is all the way down at the end of the hall at what we call Kids Central. They're going to have a great time. And you're in for a treat this morning as well, because today we have John Parker that's going to be here speaking with us. He did a great job for service. John is the director of Green Country Camp over in Disney, Oklahoma. I've gotten to work with him a lot doing camps and retreats over the years, and he's just got a great heart for God. So let's give a warm central welcome to John Parker. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. It is uh, a blessing and a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, yes, a, a, a true blessing. Um, when uh, Ryland texted me a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, and asked me uh, if I would like to come and preach at Central, uh, I said, let me pray about it. Mm, yes, yes, I, that's, that's how long, about how long it took for me to, to uh, uh, say yes, I would uh, love to come and, uh, and share with you guys. My name's John. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I I get this a lot when I visit churches around here. They ask me, am I, am I related to this John Parker or that? How many of you know of another John Parker? Because there's apparently nobody in here. Okay, well, I was totally wrong. The first service, it was like, there were several people that knew John Parkers. And so, uh, but no, all my Parkers are from uh, North Carolina. And so uh, my dad was in, in the Army in Vietnam, was stationed in Fort Sill, met my mom in Sulphur. So I'm an Oakley, Oakey boy, born and raised in Duncan. But we've been in Disney America. Well, I won't say Disney America because Disney... Uh, America, that's, you don't think of Grand Lake, you think of Orlando. Uh, we've been in Disney, Oklahoma, America for the past seven and a half years. We just celebrated our eighth summer at Green Country Camp, which is Green Country Baptist Assembly. How many of you know where Disney is? How many of you know where Green Country Baptist Assembly, also known as now Green Country Camp, uh, because you know how it is, you don't really want to tell anybody you're Baptist, but uh, you know how it is. Green Country Camp, how many of you have ever been out there? Well, good. Well, good. That's, I'm glad some of you have some experience with that. And uh, so if you haven't been out there in a while, come back and see us. Uh, God's really done some great things. We've really enjoyed camp ministry. Um, we uh, have been in ministry since uh, the late 90s. And uh, my wife is here, uh, Jennifer. Uh, we've been married since uh, I was 19. She was 18. We've been, we celebrate 26 uh, years this summer. We have four kids. I have two that are in Stillwater right now, and that's where I was yesterday crying and trying to keep my voice for today, okay, uh, sitting in the stands. And then we have um, two younger ones uh, as well. So we, we call them affectionately our varsity and our JV. Uh, and so um, uh, but, but we love them. And uh, Colton is 21, Caitlin's 19, uh, Kinley is, uh, I think she's 10. Is she 10 now? Is she 11 yet? Okay, 10. And then Crew, uh, my youngest, that loved the fact that y'all had children's church. He took off. He is, uh, he's, uh, how old is he? He's eight, right? Yeah, okay, he's eight. I'm sorry. I, it's just the way that, you know, with my hair, with a lot of memories and uh, a lot of uh, the ability to remember things like my kids' birthdays. But anyways, we've been excited to be here. We, we've been, I've been looking forward to coming. And I've also, too, just wanted to come and worship with you guys because, uh, like Roland said, we've had, I've got experience with your staff members. I don't have any experience with your church necessarily, but I've got experience with your, your staff members. Ryland has um, uh, led worship for us for several years uh, uh, at the camp for at least one week, if not two weeks sometimes in the summertime. So we get to take full advantage of his talents and abilities. And then, of course, we know Red Kev. Um, and so you, you feel my pain. No, uh, we, we love uh, Kevin. He has been an absolute uh, blessing to our family. He has an affinity for my, my, my second child, uh, my daughter, Caitlin. They're the same personalities, um, which is scary because that means that some of that is in me or Jennifer. I think it's in Jennifer, uh, my wife. But, um, uh, and so we love Kevin. We love Ryland. And interestingly enough, you know, October is crazy because there's lots of things that happen in October. There was uh, Domestic Abuse uh, Awareness Month, and uh, Day Spring Villa is a great ministry. If you can support them, do that. Uh, it's an awesome, awesome ministry to support. Uh, it's also um, 
uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and you've seen the pink socks and the pink, um, um, p- pink uniforms that football teams and other teams have been wearing, and so we want to raise awareness for that. It's also Pastor Appreciation Month, right? Now, I hope that you've appreciated your, your, your pastors here, your ministers, because they do an awesome job. And like I said, I know a lot of guys in ministry. I know a lot of pastors. I know a lot of ministers. I know a lot of uh, lay leaders. And, and, and Central Baptist is blessed with some of the best. I mean, I'm telling you right now, absolutely uh, blessed with some of the best. Um, and uh, the guys that I've gotten to know, the guys that I don't know that I'm getting to know real well, Matt and some of your other guys that are around here, uh, are just doing an awesome job. So we're excited. Um, I'm excited to be here if you didn't know that already. In camp ministry, you know, we, we really focus on a couple of things in the summertime. We try to focus on the holistic life of a follower, of a believer, um, but in camp ministry, we really focus on two areas. We major on evangelism, where we share the gospel. We want every child and teenager and every adult as well to hear the, the, uh, the uh, salvation message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life-changing message of, of Christ, and how that can totally change their world and change their destination and, and be a life-changing, have a life-changing experience that way. But we also, too, um, we also focus in on the discipleship part. We want believers who come young or old, or been, mar- been, uh, been uh, a believer for uh, a year, or two years, or 10 years, or however long, and when they come to the camp, they grow spiritually um, with Christ. That's what I want to focus on this morning. I want to talk to you guys this morning in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, um, Christ was all about discipleship. You know, he was teaching. Ever through the scripture, all through the scripture, he teaches. He focuses on um, sharing uh, the future and talking about the future and talking about the promises and teaching and teaching and teaching. He's always doing this along with all the other miracles he's doing. But it's really interesting because in Luke chapter 24, verses 13, 24 talks about, uh, 1 through 12 talks about the resurrection. This is Resurrection Sunday. This is uh, uh, Christ has just returned from the grave, just returned from, uh, from the grave victorious over sin and death, setting us free, accomplishing what he set out to do the entire time, which is the payment of our sins, okay, the payment for our sins to be right with God, right relationship with God. He's just done this in verses 1 through 12, and Peter and the apostles and the ladies who go and go to, to treat the body of Jesus, they find the empty tomb and they come back. And then in verses 13 through 32, which is where we're going to be today, we see an encounter, the first encounter that Christ has with believers after he is resurrected from the body. Now, Jesus is always discipling, and that's what we're going to talk about today, that Jesus is always discipling. And because Christ is always discipling, if we are a follower of Christ, if we are a follower of the way, if we are a Christian, which means many Christ, then of course we must be about discipling. And there's five things that on the road to Emmaus, the lessons from this road on it to Emmaus that I believe that Christ shows us today on how we are to be a discipler how we are to model how he looked at those who followed him, who called themselves Christians, who called them believers, who called themselves followers of the way, how they did that. So let's take a look at verses 13 through 32. Verse 13 starts out, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now Emmaus is just a few miles outside of Jerusalem, towards the west, heading towards the coast. And This is the very same day that Christ is resurrected. This is not like a day later or two days later or a week later. This is within the very same hours that they have discovered that the tomb is empty. So this is very, very fresh. And it says two disciples. It doesn't actually say, and we learn here in a second, one of them's name is Cleopas, but we don't actually know that they were two men. In fact, they could have been been a, a, a married couple. Could have been a man and wife. We don't know that they're men. The original language does not say two men. It says two disciples, so we actually don't know. But they were on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We're assuming that's their hometown. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, Jesus... As they're talking and walking and talking about the events, and obviously, if you're a follower of Christ, 
which says these were disciples, which means the followers, which means learners, those who follow under a teacher, under a guide, under a teacher, and the teacher would be Jesus. If you are a disciple of Jesus, the man who has just been crucified, the gruesome death that was just observed, the, the, um, the uh, cataclysmic event that occurred, if you are a follower, if you're a disciple of someone, that means that you have sold out. That means that you have basically forsaken pretty much everything else, their heritage of faith as far as being a Jew, because it says later on that they were, they were Jews, that their chief priests are the ones that put him to death. They were Jews, and so they had pretty much sold out everything for Jesus. Jesus is crucified, he's, he's put to death, and now then they find that his tomb is empty. And so their minds are filled with just, I mean, a ton of emotions, a ton of emotions. One of the main emotions, though, that it says later on is, is sadness. But as they are on their way, Jesus himself approaches them. Now, when we think of discipling, of being a disciple, someone who's a mentor in the faith, someone who's pouring in the lives, which if you didn't know that by now, if you are a Christian, if you're a follower, if you're a believer of the way, follower of the way, you are called to be a discipler. We have to understand the first thing, if that's what your calling is, we have to understand the first thing that Christ does here to show us how to be a great disciple. And the first thing he does is that he engages them on a personal level. On verse 15, he engaged them himself. It says, while, we were, while they were talking, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool that Jesus himself drew near? Now listen, this is just right after he rose up out of the grave. This is right after he was resurrected. The first thing that Jesus does is not gather the troops. He doesn't show up to Peter. He doesn't show up to the ladies who went to, to, uh, to treat the body. He doesn't show up to his biggest supporters. He shows up to two disciples along the road and comes and engages them personally. Now, as believers, if we are going to mentor someone, if we're going to put, um, if we're going to be obedient and encourage those that we know that love Christ, that are believers in Christ, to grow deeper in, our, in their walk with Christ, we have to engage them on a personal level. He approached them. This includes things like when we approach someone or when we engage someone on a personal level, we have to take into consideration their background. We have to take into consideration their life situation. We have to take into consideration their salvation experience, their conversion story. We have to take into consideration where they are spiritually, but not just where they are spiritually, not just Hey, have you been to church lately? Hey, how are you dealing with sin? But also mentally and emotionally. We know that we are well-rounded human beings, right? That we have all these stages, all these different facets to our life, not just spiritual beings, but also emotional beings and, and um, psychological beings and physical beings as well. All the four ways that Christ himself developed on earth, we develop as well. And for us to be able to truly speak into the lives of the people that are around us, we have got to reach them on a personal level. We have got to reach where they at, where they are at. <clears throat> For, um, for several years, I taught public school. Any teachers out here? Have any teachers? Oh, you've, you've enjoyed the last several days, haven't you? Fall break, mercy. There's like one or two, just two? Is there just two? Who else? You know, three, four, okay, several, good. All right, so can we get a whoop, whoop, right, for fall break, right? Students, can you get a whoop, whoop for fall break, right? Oh, they're asleep. Okay, we got one over here, all right? When I taught, though, one of the main sayings as a teacher is that they don't care how much you know until they, teachers, anyone, know how much you care, right? They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, all right? So we have got to address people where they're at. We have got to speak into their hearts. We have got to think about more than just how are you, like, more than, just, more than just, hey, how was the game? Or, hey, how's that truck coming? Or, how's work? Or, how's, but instead, how are you doing? How are you spiritually? You know, what's God doing in your life? 
How are you mentally? Have you, have you been, been down about things? How are you? Um, I don't know if you guys watch social media much, but over the last week or so, there's an interview done with the new princess, right, Meghan Markle, and she said, how are you, and this interviewer said, how are you doing? I mean, you look like, how are you holding up? And, and you could just tell. I mean, here I am across the pond, right, thousands of miles away. I'm watching this video of her, and she is just literally about to cry right there. I mean, the pressure is just ridiculous, on, 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 uh, on the princess. And you can just see the, the pain in her eyes and almost just tears just welling up. And that reporter was saying, how are you? How are you doing? How are you holding up? We have got to be personal like that. Jesus himself was personal when he interacted with his disciples. But not only was he engaging with them on a personal level, he also um, was able to speak truth into their life. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing. This is cool. Verse 16, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. In other words, <clears throat> Christ kind of just, he kind of veiled their eyes, okay? He, he supernaturally somehow kept them from understanding that he was Jesus Christ, that he was the Messiah, that he was the one who had just died for their sins, who had just died on the cross. Of course, they, they were going to understand slowly that he died for their sins in, in a little bit, but died on the cross, their teacher, their rabbi that they'd been following they, he, he veiled himself from them. He kept them from recognizing him. Verse 17, he said to them, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Again, another personal question. Another personal question. Someone asking a personal question to gain access to them on a personal level. Christ asking. And they still stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. It's interesting there that they identify uh, with, identify them still as a Jew, obviously, uh, and, 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 and actually call out their own people as those ones who would crucify Christ, the chief priests. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. So Cleopas gives him a full rundown of the conversation of which they're having. They're talking about the days, the weekends, events. Undoubtedly, no, no doubt that they were there for the Passover, right? A good Jew travels to Jerusalem for the Passover. So Cleopas and partner were sitting there. The other disciple were sitting there. They were a part of what was going on. They had seen everything that had occurred. They had witnessed everything that had occurred. They had hopes in the Messiah, and they let Christ know all these things, and they undoubtedly let him know they were confused as to what was going to happen next. They didn't know where to go from there. You can tell some of those were here, some of those this, some said this. We had reports that he came back from the grave. We had women go to the tomb. Who knows? Look at Jesus' response in verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? He, I mean, when you call someone a foolish, I mean, he didn't call him a fool, he called him a foolish one. I don't know that there's much difference in that, right? I mean, that's pretty going to get your attention stark I am going to tell you your, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to instruct you. You see, he was not afraid to correct the false ideas. He corrected the false ideas. And as a disciple, someone who is speaking to someone, someone who's teaching, mentoring, pouring into the lives of someone else who's a believer, we need to be about teaching truth as opposed to the false ideas and correcting false ideas. You see, Christ Sitting there on the road, hearing the story, he's hearing the experiences, he's hearing the emotions of his followers, 
And he's saying, listen, these are the experiences and emotions that you have, but this is not the truth. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm an emotional guy, right? Okay, my, my wife, my kids can attest, if you know me, you can know that I'm an emotional guy. Ryland and Revkev can tell you I am an emotional guy, all right? It took everything I had yesterday to, to have a voice today, right? Like I'm, I'm almost sitting here with, on my hands as we're getting beat, and we shouldn't be getting beat, right? As these things are happening, and they shouldn't be happening, all right? Any cowboy fans out there that are, yeah, all right, okay, we're sitting. Wow, this is a bunch of Sooners in here because, wow, not many cowboys, okay. And we're sitting there, hey, well, at least we know how to drive a wagon. Okay, anyways, we're just glad no one got hurt, right? Okay, um, <clears throat> at least you won, right? The wheels may have fallen off the wagon, but they have not fallen off of the football team, right? As I'm sitting there yesterday, I'm putting my hand, I'm, I'm like, okay, I cannot yell, cannot yell, because most, most of the time when we leave a football game, I'm, I got no voice, right? I'm preaching today, bringing God's word. <sighs> shut up, John, shut up, right? Shut up. So I'm an emotional guy. And as I know this, and as I read God's word, and as I continue to grow as a believer, I know that my flesh, my emotions, my experiences can lead me astray. That a lot of times, my thoughts and my words and my actions and the way that I perceive things, they don't line up with God's word. Uh, that's, just, that's just how it is. God's word teaches us that we are flesh, that we are evil, that we are, uh, our, our righteousness is as rags, that we are faulty thinking, right? And the truth of the matter is, is that when I hold up my experiences and my emotions and my thoughts and my feelings and my flesh to the scripture, a lot of times I'm not in line. In the same way, Christ is seeing Cleopas and he's going, listen, your experiences, your emotions, what you've seen, that's not the truth. Let me tell you the truth. He's saying, oh, foolish ones, uh, you need to understand. Do you not know that this must happen? He says, slow of heart to believe. We got any slow of heart to believe in here? I mean, I'm, I'm right there. Don't you know that all the prophets have spoken. What is it not necessary that the Christ could suffer these things and enter into his glory? See, we're fleshly people. We're fallen. And we make mistakes. And we let our experiences and our emotions and our heart dictate to us truth. And the truth is, is that Christ is saying, that's not true. When we mentor someone, when we pour into the lives of someone, when we share truth with them, we need to be about teaching them correcting false ideas. Correcting false emotions. <clears throat> I have a friend. He's a dear friend of mine. He's a Christian. He's a believer <clears throat> and um, professes to know Christ and is a wonderful man. <clears throat> but every time that I get around him and I talk a little bit about politics or even, I don't even really have to talk about politics. I just get around him. He believes that our, our president is like just the right hand of God. I mean, that he is just going to deliver us all, that he is God's tool to deliver us from evil and hatred and persecution and high interest rates. And I mean, just everything, right? All the bad stuff, right? If you're a banker here, I'm sorry. I know you guys like a little higher interest rate. But do you understand what I'm saying? That he's the answer. He's the cat's meow. He's going to be the solve for all of our wounds. He's going to be everything that we ever need to the point to where, you know, and I, I have not, this is, this is me, okay? This is me. I have not said to him, my brother, God ordains every presidency. He, he ordained the presidency before this one, whether you know it or not. He, he ordains the one that's coming up next. He ordains every government. There is not a government that is on this country or on this earth, on this world, on this globe that is been established that God did not foreordain it. But yet I have not told him that truth, and it is my, my call, it is my burden to share with him that there is no man of which we can put our faith. There is no religion, there's no religious group, there's no political party, there's no ideology that we can base our truth on. This is where we base our truth. 
Another false idea sometimes that I don't correct is all the time that we've been raising our four children, <clears throat> I've had parents, I was in youth ministry for many, many years, and, and I always had parents say, well, at least they're not doing what I did at my age. And this is true. I have caught myself saying that a lot, right? Like I was a ringtail tutor, right? I mean, I was getting into everything. You ever, y'all are looking like you don't ever, never, never heard that term, ringtail? Anybody ever used the word ringtail tutor, right? Okay. I was a mess, right? And there's some times that I've said, oh man, at least my kids are not doing what I used to do. Man, that's, that's awesome. And I hear that all the time. That is so wrong. So wrong on so many levels. I am not the example. Praise the Lord, I'm not the example. Christ is. That Christ is the example for our teenagers. Listen, parents, if you're sitting here, by the way, I didn't really say this. You're looking for somebody to, to, to disciple, which we'll talk about in a second. But parents, your number one disciplee, right? Number one mentor is your children, right? Disciple your children first, then go elsewhere. But parents, our, our uh, example is not us, and it's not another person. It, it is Christ. It's Scripture. Uh, so I just that was extra, okay? You, you didn't, that's just extra thoughts. Christ was not afraid to correct false ideas. You know what else he was not afraid to do? He wasn't afraid to teach through the Scriptures. Verse 27, beginning with Moses, all the prophets he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself, Another thing that Christ did where we should be a good discipler is that he taught the entire word. It says he taught from the Moses and the prophets all the way through the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Isn't that cool? That he taught himself. That is so cool. That he taught him all the things about himself. I love it that it says that. That he didn't sugarcoat it. That in his truth, he did not sugarcoat the message. He didn't sugarcoat the truth of what they should know according to scriptures. Of how he, Christ, the Messiah, came as payment for sin. Of how he was the fulfillment of all of the prophecies in the Old Testament. About how he came to fulfill all the words that the prophets had said. And he didn't slow down. It's cool that he presented it also too humbly. You know, he didn't reveal himself. He still hadn't revealed himself. He presented it humbly to these disciples and let the scriptures teach them. Let the scriptures teach them. Listen, when we are to mentor someone as a believer, when we are to speak truth in love, when we are to correct these false ideas, we need to not sugarcoat the word of God. We need to bring the things, the hard stuff, like the good stuff. We need to bring all the hard stuff like we bring the good. With just as much fervor as we bring the, the Psalms and we love to read the Psalms and we love to enjoy God's word and we love to bring, you know, Philippians 4.13 to every athletic event that we've ever, I mean, I used to coach, right? So I can say every athletic event, you know, everybody's got Philippians 4.13 on the inside of their hat or inside their locker or other pieces of equipment, whatever, Right? But you need to teach the rest of Philippians 4, right? About starving and being hungry and being destitute. And hey, you know, more than you can just throw a football, it's really talking about being able to stay alive and, and, and in Christ and be able to breathe in and out and be able to do all those things in Christ because he strengthens us. We teach the thoroughness of Scripture and we don't sugarcoat it just as Christ did. Then also too, verse 28, he goes on. So they drew near to a village to which they were going. He acted as if he were gonna go further. I love that. He acted as if he's gonna go on. He's looking to see if they've really, if he set the hook, you know? Like you're a fisherman right there and you throw that bait out there and you present that present the bait, right? Got any fishermen? You present the bait, right? I'm not a fisherman. I live across from a lake and I haven't fished there I'm twice in seven years, eight years. So I'm horrible, okay? But you set it out there, you present the bait, right? And you get that, get the bite and then you got to set the hook. He's, he's seeing here if he's actually set the hook with these guys, all right? They say, oh, wait a second. 
29, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So in other words, the sun's going down. You need a place to stay. Why don't you please, please, please come stay with us. So obviously they're hooked. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to him. That's cool. What's the last thing that Christ did before he died? He broke bread with the apostles. In the last supper, upper room. What's the first thing he does when he appears again? Breaks bread with disciples in a room. And what did he do in last supper? He served the bread. What's he do here? Serves the bread. As soon as he gives it to him, the scales fall off. The veil is lifted. Christ appears in front of their eyes. Now that's cool. But before we go, you need to understand this. Christ here in verse 28 showed the value of fellowship. Showed the value of fellowship. Now, I, he's not, not talking, he didn't say, I'm not saying that he showed the value of a potluck supper. Right? That's not what I'm saying. Although when Baptists, when you say fellowship, you immediately go potluck dinner, right? I mean, because I was born in the bread, born and died in the wool, Southern Baptist, been in Southern Baptist all my life. When you say fellowship, you think eat. Now, obviously, they, this is why this, is why this happens, folks. It's in Scripture. It's in Scripture, you break bread and you eat. And what's the best thing? You see Jesus when that happens, right? So that's why we think eating is so important when we get together. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, he showed the value of fellowship, right? He did not neglect them. He didn't say, well, I've spent enough time with you guys. I'm going to send you guys. Y'all, y'all, y'all eat without me. It's okay. It's okay. No, no. He understood that they wanted to, to continue this relationship, Okay? To continue, to continue this, when we, when we are mentoring, when we are discipling, when we are pouring into the lives, when we are teaching, we need to know and understand that this is a relationship based thing. Can't think of a better word. Relationship based thing, okay? That we find value not just in teaching them, correcting the truths, not just in them learning the Word of God but also a value in them as a person. Again, it goes back to that education motto, right? They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That they know and understand that we love them as brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to do life. I'm sure somewhere along the way, Central Baptist has said, it may be in the motto, it may be in the, in the statement, doing life together, right? You see that a lot from, from churches. There's, there's meat to those bones, doing life together. This is what it is. Christ did not teach them and then say, okay, you know, you guys go and you enjoy your meal. I'm done here. I finished my lesson. There we go. Because it leads to a deeper relationship. You see, because it's an opportunity to exhibit spiritual principles in the Christian faith, right? To do life together, to go to sporting uh, events together, to Go to worship concerts together. To go to concerts, period. To go bowling together, right? You're never going to know truly how deep a Christian is in their Christian walk until they gutter the ball five times in a row, right? I mean, that's going to tell you just exactly how deep a believer they are, right? That's life. Guys, this is not, this is not life. I mean, this is awesome right here. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Like, this is awesome right here. I mean, this is amazing. I'm just gonna tell you, I've been in a lot of churches and a lot of places. This is a blessing to me, to my family, knowing your ministers, knowing your pastors. But this is not life. That out there is life. That's where we need to be together out there, right? This is practice. Again, a coach, used to coach. I used to say all the time, this is practice. That's the game. That's where you get in the game out there. Same thing with our relationships, we need to understand, we need to understand, building fellowship with each other is important. And it's important when you're teaching someone, when you're being a mentor someone on how to be a believer. They need to see you in the real world. Last thing from the scripture here, that Christ teaches us about being a mentor, being a discipler. He breaks the bread, hands it to him, the veil comes off. Their eyes were open, they recognized him, and he vanishes from their sight. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on that. That might be another sermon. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while we talked to, 
while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour, returned to Jerusalem. Christ himself, the scriptures, the heart, our hearts burned within us while he discussed the scriptures with us. You see, Christ himself, he did not reveal his face. And there's a reason why. He's a, there's a reason why. It's because he was relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work. He's relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work. The paraclete, which is the Greek word for helper, which is who the Holy Spirit is. He helps us. You would not be understanding what I'm teaching today if it was not for the help of the Holy Spirit. He is among us here as we open his word. He is in every Sunday school class as we open his word. That's why we ask when we, when we study God's word, when we teach it, when we prepare a lesson, when we do anything with God's word, we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and to be a part of what we're doing and to teach us. And the reason is, is because Christ designed it that way. Otherwise, he would have revealed himself at the very beginning, right? When we're mentoring someone, when we're discipling someone, there's gonna be failure. We're going to fall. We're going to fall. We have to trust that the Holy Spirit is doing a work in their hearts. Listen, sometimes we can be persuasive, right? Like there's sometimes, some of us can persuade an Eskimo to buy a refrigerator, right? And I'm sure that there are some Eskimos out there that have bought refrigerators or whatever, right? I'm sure that's happened. But there's some of us that we can be pretty persuasive. I've seen it time and time again. Listen, I'm in camp ministry. You can talk a child into getting saved. Do you understand? You can talk a child into getting saved. The first thing we do when we have an uh, orientation is we talk to our adults and we say, listen, if that kid has gotten saved at VBS, if they've got saved two weeks later at a, a, a backyard Bible club, if they got saved a week later at the Harvest Festival, whatever, and they're trying to make a decision here, chill, chill. Let's not record the decision just because we got a decision. Let's let the Holy Spirit do the work. Let's ask for understanding. Let's, let's ask for the ability for their eyes to be open to their spiritual awareness. You can talk someone to be a, being a, a believer. You can do that. Sometimes even it's just for them to you know, get off the back, get, for you to get off their back. But the Holy Spirit, Christ is wanting him to work in their hearts as you're teaching these believers, as you're mentoring them, as you're discipling them, we are desiring and we are praying, as Christ showed us this example, that not our influence, not because we have such and such, not because we have beautiful flowing hair, right, or a great physique, or we're popular, or whatever it is, but because the power of the Holy Spirit is doing a work in their hearts and their minds and their lives. That's true transformation. That's true transformation, uh, it's called spiritual growth, what I also known as sanctification, sanctification, which is the daily growing into Jesus Christ, daily looking like him more and more, becoming more and more like Christ. It's something that we do every day as a believer. We either grow closer towards Christ to look more like him or we grow uh, further away from him and look less like him. And I am in that crowd, y'all, every day. More like Christ or less like Christ? Because I'm a what? I'm a human. I am yet not perfect. I don't yet have the long flowing blonde locks of which I will have in eternity. We allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. We allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify that person. Let them fall down. Let them make mistakes. Pick them back up. Love them when they do. And sometimes it takes time. Christ walked, he taught, he talked, he invested, he fellowshiped, he told it to him straight, he taught him thoroughly, and he let the Spirit do the work. And that's where we've got to be. We've got to let the Holy Spirit, uh, we have to remember to ask the Holy Spirit to do the work. That's another key. Challenge to you today as we close. What would it look like? Are you sitting out here today and you're like, you know, I've never discipled anyone. I've never become a mentor in the faith to someone. You're sitting here today and I want you to tell you, if you have a pulse, you love Jesus, you follow him, you are called to be a mentor. 
called to be a discipler in some way. You are called to teach the faith. Disciples, disciple. No one is exempt. It's not the pastor's job. It's not the Sunday school's teacher's job. It's not. You are to pass along the faith. If you're sitting out here and you're going, I just don't know how. I don't know who. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. You know someone right now. God's putting in your mind someone that you can pass along your faith to. Again, like I said, parents, it's your kids first and then others. Grandparents, seniors, don't think that just because you come into contact with just the barber once a week or once every two weeks and then, you know, a few other people that you're exempt. God is putting people in your path. New believers, young believers, even older believers that are maybe just young in the faith, that are still drinking milk. Someone to disciple. What would it look like if Central was just overrun by those who desired to mentor others in Christ, others in the word, who wanted to teach the word, who wanted to pour into fellowship with them, who wanted to watch the Holy Spirit work? What would it look like? And then if you're sitting out here today and you're thinking, you know what, I think I'm ready to be a disciple. You're sitting here today and you've had a lot of questions. You're not really sure how this Christianity thing works. You're not sure what, you're not sure if it's for you. But you're sitting here today and maybe the Holy Spirit, which we talked so much about over the last few minutes, has started to work something in your heart and you've got questions. And you're thinking maybe you're feeling a calling on your heart that maybe he's calling you to be a disciple to be a follower of his, a follower of the way. Well, this time is for you too. We've got pastors here. I'll be here and show you the scriptures on how to become a believer. The time's now. It's pretty important. It's the first thing that Christ did when he came back out of the grave. Pretty important, right? Let's make it that. Just bow your heads with me. Now, you, again, there are people sitting all over this room, all different stages of their faith journey. All different stages. Some of you have been in, it, been in the game for a long time. Your faith is deep. And you really need to pour into somebody else. I mean, God's really calling you to pour into somebody else. Disciples, disciple. That's just what happens. Or you're sitting here today and you're like, well, I'm a new believer. I, I, I haven't been a believer for very long, maybe just a couple years. That's okay. That doesn't matter. Grow together. Find someone to disciple. Now, if you're sitting here today and you're like, John, I'm, I'm a young believer, two years, three years, 10 years, whatever, and I've still got a lot of questions, then you go find someone. You say, I'm gonna go find the deacon, the minister, the pastor, the elder of the church. They've been a member, they've been a, a, a believer for years. I wanna go learn. I wanna go learn. I'm struggling with this. I wanna go deeper. I wanna get off the milk. I wanna get into the meat of the word. I wanna know how to overcome. I wanna be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to, I desire a deeper walk. You go grab someone that you know, that you've seen them. You've seen them lead Bible study. You've seen them lead uh, worship, teach a Sunday school class. You've seen them speak into the hearts. You've seen them serve in, on mission trips. You, you know who they are. You go grab them. Say, I want to grow deeper. And then you're sitting here today, and you've never truly given your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've just been coming and, and, and going to church. That's cool. That's awesome. But he's calling you to be a believer, a follower of his, not just a church member. Not just a church member. You don't just come here and become a Christian. You become a Christian by dying to yourself, taking up your cross, denying yourself. Whoever told anyone from the very beginning that being a follower of Christ is easy, lied. It's not scriptural. It's not even in the word. Jesus, every time he teaches, he teaches totally against that. It is not easy but it is so worth it. You will never regret it, ever. So as I pray, we'll be down front. If you need to come to the connection room, there's a connection room off to the side. If you have questions, and while we're singing, if you have questions, you just go right over to that room. And when we see 
you heading over that way, we'll head over there too. You just go right on in there, get questions answered. Or if you want to come to the front and you are a believer and you want to mentor, you want to, you feeling the Holy Spirit doing something that you need to disciple, you need to speak truth to someone's life, you need to bring someone up in the faith, you come up, the altar's open, you come pray, I'll pray with you. You come pray, the altar's open. You let God do the work in you. Father, I come and as we allow the Holy Spirit to work, Father, I pray that you would move in a mighty way, that we would be submissive to you, to your will, and that we would help others grow in the faith. We know we're messed up. No one's perfect. There are no perfect people, just obedient believers. That's all you call for, just obedience, not perfection. So anyone can disciple. So Father, I pray that you move in our hearts right now. Do this in your name I pray, amen. You stand, stand as we sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. Oh, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Maybe you didn't have the courage to step forward this morning, but you felt the calling of God on your heart. Don't leave this place. Don't leave this room until you respond to whatever he's leading you to do. Our connection room will be open when we dismiss in just a moment. Thank you so much for being here at Central this morning. Um, let's just say thank you to John Parker for bringing the word this morning. <laughs> Greatly appreciate him. Make sure you stop by and shake his hand and tell him thank you. Church family, let's dismiss by saying our purpose statement together. Central Baptist Church, we exist to live for Christ, love people, and make disciples. You're dismissed. Have a great Sunday.